We're almost at the end of this series and today we're going to be talking about two. There are two main branches of calculus. Calculus is known as the study of changes. Really, really, really small changes. Now one word that you'll hear being thrown around in calculus quite a lot is infinitesimals. A bit like how infinity is the biggest number that you can have, sort of. Infinitesimals are the smallest numbers that you can have. Infinitesimals aren't quite zero, but they're the closest thing that you can get to being zero. They're really, really small. Now calculus was invented back in the 17th century, and its invention it's a bit confusing. Basically, Sir Isaac Newton came up with the idea for calculus, but at the same time, Leibniz also came up with the idea of calculus independently. Newton then accused Leibniz for stealing his work, and for a bit later, people split into two sides depending on whether they believe that Newton came up with calculus or Leibniz came up with calculus. Of course, nowadays, we credit both Newton and Leibniz to be co-inventors, of calculus. We credit Leibniz for most of the notations that we use in calculus today and for coining in the term calculus and we credit Sir Isaac Newton for taking calculus and then putting it into actual applications, mainly in physics. And as I've mentioned there are two main branches of calculus and that is differential calculus and integral calculus. Differential calculus deals a lot with rates of changes of various stuff. Basically, when we're working with differential calculus, we're interested in how fast something is changing with respect to another variable. For example, if I have a moving ball, its displacement is changing over time. And so in differential calculus, we can try to find the rate of change of that displacement or the velocity of the ball. So what do I mean by this? Well, let's say I have a graph which shows the displacement of the ball with respect to time. Now, without using calculus, I could find the average velocity over a certain period of time. So for example, if I wanna know the average velocity between these two periods of time, what do I do? I can just find the gradient of that line I just drew. Gradient will basically just equal to rise over run. Or for this case, will equal to the change in x, the change in displacement, divided by the change in time. But what if instead I'm not interested in the average velocity over a certain period of time? I'm more interested in the velocity of the ball at a particular point in time. So for example, if I want to know the velocity of the ball at this particular time, well basically what I could do is I could simply draw a tangent to that line at that point and then find the gradient of that line. But that could be a bit in accurate when just drawing tangents. So instead we'll use a different strategy. Instead I'll still draw two points as I did earlier and the gradient of those two points again will be delta x divided by delta t. But now what I can do is I can move these two points closer and closer together so that delta t becomes smaller and smaller and I can move it so close that delta t becomes such a small number until delta t becomes infinitesimally small. You can think of it as the two points being so close together that delta t is so small that the two points are almost pretty much overlapping at the time that we're interested in. And so now with the two points so close together, we can actually find the instantaneous velocity at that point. And this is the basics to differential calculus. Differential calculus is just like finding the gradients of a graph at a certain point, but the two points that you're trying to find the gradients of are really, really, really close together. And when we're trying to find the gradient of this line between those two points, when we're trying to find the instantaneous velocity, we can write this out as an infinitesimally small change in x, or dx, divided by an infinitesimally change in t, or dt. And like how delta x divided by delta t is just the change of displacement over a change in time, dx over dt is just basically a really, 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 really small change in x divided by a really, 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 really small change in t. And dx and dt are both what we call differentials, which are infinitesimally small lengths. And finding the velocity at a certain point is just taking that differential of x and divided by the differential of t. That sentence I just said might have angered quite a few people out there, but we'll just move along anyways. And now we move over to integral calculus. Integral calculus mainly involves an infinite sum of infinitesimally small amounts. 
Let's see what I mean by this. Let's say I have a graph of a different ball, but instead now we have the graph of the ball's velocity with respect to time. What do I do if I want to find the displacement of this ball? Well, we know that displacement of the ball can be found if we know the area under the velocity time graph. So let's say we want to know the displacement of the ball over these two time periods here. Well, basically what I could do is I could draw a rectangle on the graph. And so the area of the rectangle, which is equal to the velocity times the change in t. But this is not that accurate because as you can see, the area of this rectangle doesn't even cover the entire graph. This bits here that it's covering that it shouldn't be covering, and then this bit that it should be covering that it's not actually covering. And so what we can do is we can divide this rectangle so it's smaller. So that the delta t, the width of the rectangle is smaller, and so we can get a more accurate idea of the area under the graph. But why stop there? We can divide the rectangle more, and more and more until we get rectangles that are so small that it actually covers the entire graph. Now in this diagram, the rectangle will still have a height of V, but the width of the rectangle will be so, so small. Delta T is approaching zero. It becomes a really, really small number. And with such infinitesimally small widths, we're gonna have an infinite number of rectangles in here. And so what we're doing here is we're summing, we're adding the areas of an infinite number of rectangles, where the rectangles will have an infinitesimally small area. And so basically we're adding an infinite number of infinitesimal small rectangles. And this is the concept behind integration. And if we want to describe with calculus, the area of the rectangle will just equal to its height or V times the infinitesimal small width, which we'll say is the dt. And because we're summing an infinite number of area, rather than writing this whole sum like this, we'll use a special symbol to denote this called the integral symbol. And as an added bonus, because we're summing it over a time interval between a and b, we can write a and b here like this to denote that it's between the interval a and b. And this thing here that we just wrote out is what we call the definite integral. It's definite because it gives you a definite answer. It gives you a definite actual number which is the area under the curve. But if I don't put the numbers at the integral sign like this, then we find what we call the indefinite integral. Now the process of differentiation and the process of integration are linked by something called the fundamental theorem of calculus. And so to summarize what the theorem says, it basically states that differentiation and integration are basically just reverse processes. And because of this theorem, finding the indefinite integral that I've mentioned earlier is just basically also finding the antiderivative of a function, or just reversing the differentiation process, or undoing the differentiation if you want. If you have a function and you derive it, you'll get another function. And in order to go from differentiated function back to the original function, you can find its indefinite integral, or anti-differentiated. But anyways, that's it for my video today. Two, there are two main branches of calculus.